All right, so we want to start exploring Gauss's law in this video and probably in a couple sequential ones. Um, and Gauss's law, for some background, is going to be one of the fundamental equations in electrodynamics. And Gauss's law is the first of Maxwell's equations. So it's the first Maxwell equation. Uh, maybe we'll say first of Maxwell's equations. Okay, and these equations govern um, pretty much everything we know about electricity and magnetism, and in particular, um, and light, okay? But as we will see, it turns out that light is nothing more than coupled oscillating electric and magnetic fields. So um, this equation is very, very important. And we will um, start with, well, we'll just present it first and then we will build around it. Okay, so this is Gauss's law. Now, why are Maxwell's equations so important? Okay, so Maxwell's equations are so important because they contain the information from which we can rederive every other principle of um, the subfields of electricity and magnetism, namely things like electrostatics, which is what we're studying right now, where we're looking at charges that are not in motion, right? We're, we're, we're holding our charge distributions fixed and calculating what the accelerations are or what the electric fields are of the charge distributions. Um, but Maxwell's equations, uh, there's also the topic of magnetostatics, which we will get to. Um, but electrodynamics is the field of study where that restriction of static cases doesn't have to hold anymore. And so when you have a non-static situation, um, the electric fields of your charges, for example, behave much differently, uh, or, or at least can, depending on their speed, they can behave much differently than your other types of charge. Uh, or your static charge. Um, and the same thing goes for magnetized material, right? Um, but Gauss's law, on the other hand, is a universal tool. So this equation is universally true, okay? At least in the classical sense, it's universally true. It holds even when things are in motion. Now, why why is this important? Because we've already looked at Coulomb's law. But Coulomb's law is inherently a static situation, right? So, it's not a fundamental law, okay? It is not a fundamental law. And we'll see, um, not, not terribly in-depth examples of this, but we will run into this a little bit, okay? We will run into this a little bit. Um, but Gauss's law is absolutely true, okay? Um, for our purposes. Now, what, what is this equation telling us, okay? And, and why are we gonna spend a little bit of time talking about it? 
what this equation is telling you, okay, is that I'm, I'm going to explain this side of the equation and then I will have to introduce a new term. Okay, we'll have to talk about a new term after I'm done talking about this side. But what this equation is telling you is, okay, suppose I have some charge Q, okay? We know that charges give off electric fields. Um, so how can I calculate that electric field? Well, what we do is we say, okay, if I can bound my charge or enclose my charge, and that's what ENC stands for, enclosed charge. If I can enclose my charge with an imaginary boundary that has surface area A and surface area element DA, then I can calculate the flux. Ah, I gave the game away. Um, I was going to try to use, I was going to try to describe it without using that term, but in any case, I gave it away. So, flux. We use the concept of flux essentially to reverse engineer the electric field. So, with um, the static charge case, right, or, or the point charge case, I really should say the point charge case, the electric field is just given by. this, right? You have your point charge, uh, you move some distance away from that point charge, and your field is obeys the uh, inverse square law. But what if I have a collection of charges, right? So what if I have a collection of charges and I want to calculate the um, net field at a particular point in space um, due to those charges. Uh, so what this is telling you is you can enclose your charge with an imaginary surface DA. Now I will use red for my imaginary surface and I'm going to I'm going to use a sphere so imagine that this is a sphere. So I've enclosed my charge with an imaginary sphere and my imaginary sphere has imaginary radius R. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that. It doesn't have an imaginary radius. It's an imaginary object, but it has a physical size, okay? So imagine a, ra a, a sphere of some given radius. I don't want to use the word imaginary there because that might bring to mind imaginary numbers and complex analysis and we don't we don't want to go there. So I, I imagine this sphere having this size and the sphere is enclosing all of this charge. Okay. So the surface area of a sphere, remind uh, ourselves, the total surface area of a sphere is equal to pi um, 4 pi, I, I about lied, 4 pi r squared, okay? The surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, and the surface area element of a sphere, just for reference, right, is going to be the radius squared times sine theta d theta d phi. If I have time in this video, I might talk about that formula and, and the um, geometry of the sphere and where we get our um, surface area and volume calculations from that we use in calculus. But I won't for the moment, for, for the moment, just take this as it is, right? For the moment, just take this as it is. Now, fortunately, we actually won't have to use this calculation in depth, okay? At least in the situations we're going to use. But for the moment, just realize that this surface, uh, this sphere has a um, 
uh, total surface area and it has a surface area element across it that is equal to that. And then if I add up all of the surface area elements that go across the surface, I add, uh, take all of those, draw all of them that I possibly can across the surface, add all of them up, and I get 4 pi r squared. Um, what this equation is telling us is we can immediately, without resort to this equation for each individual point charge and then summing them up, we don't have to resort to that equation to calculate the electric field of a charge distribution. So this is the first um, lesson with Gauss's law. It is a very powerful tool that will allow us to calculate the electric field in principle of a um, charge distribution um, and it simplifies or can simplify uh, many of the, the calculations that we have to do. Um, in practice, applying Gauss's law to um, continuously charged elements requires high degrees of symmetry. Now, we've already mentioned that, you know, in, in the, the uh, continuously charged electric field video um, where we use the integral, I mentioned that we would use high symmetry situations there, but, okay, but the difference is right you can you can still have a highly symmetric situation even though it doesn't necessarily look symmetric right so for example we showed you how to measure the electric field of a finite rod of length 2a and uh, when your field point was on the bisecting axis right and you integrated from this end of the bar toward that end of the bar okay that's fine uh, but you can even in this situation and with the method that we developed you can find the electric field along one of the ends of the bars right and integrate from here all the way to here okay um, and really anywhere in between. This is still a highly symmetric situation um, as far as the integration is concerned, um, regardless of where you are, uh, as long as you're more or less above the, the bar, you can, you can uh, draw on some geometry to make the situation um, amenable to the uh, integral method. Um, or you can find the electric field along the long axis of the bar, for example, um, and you can find the electric fields at these points even if the bar is not uniformly charged, if the charge distribution have some, has some spatial function to it, right? Like if, if the um, charge density were not constant but were of some function that looked like this. Right? Um, and let's draw it like this. Let's get rid of the parentheses. Right? So that would almost make it look like lambda naught was a function of x, but here lambda naught's just a constant. Um, if your charge density looked something like this, where it was uniformly um, linear, so what that would mean, a function that looked like that, what that would mean is when x is zero, your charge density is zero, so you don't have any charge here, and you grow in positive charge as you get toward this end, and you would grow in negative charge as you got toward this end. So you would have a highly negative end of your bar here, a highly positive end of your bar here, this would start to approach the field of a dipole, for example. Um, 
And you can also do the calculation right here when you're not on the bisecting axis. So there's a myriad of ways in which you can still employ symmetry, but it may not be explicit symmetry the way a bisecting axis is. On the flip side, when it comes to Gauss's law, okay, when it comes to Gauss's law, there are three fundamental types of symmetry that make this calculable without using computers, okay? And those are spherical symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, and uh, planar symmetry. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I kind of gave the game away and I used the word flux. So this side of the equation represents electric flux. So let's talk a little bit about flux and then we'll come back to this equation and see how to employ it in a few of these situations. Okay, so what is electric flux? For the moment, imagine that I have some electric field lines out in space and these are coming from a source. I don't care what the source is, but I just have some electric field lines out in space. Okay. And I have a piece of paper or a window that I want these electric field lines to pass through, okay? Let's let the strength of the electric field, the overall strength of the electric field be E, and the surface area of my window be A, okay? If I can orient my uh, window and, and you can imagine that these electric fields are in three dimensions, okay? So I, I'm, I'm not sure I can draw this very well, but imagine that these aren't just stacked on top of each other in the XY plane, but they're also in the um, Z plane. Um, the, the, the lines are also coming, um, uh, the stack of lines is also coming out at you and disappearing into the uh, um, page. I'm not sure I can draw this very well, but imagine that these are also going into the page like this. And they're also stacked on top of each other going into the page. I don't know if, if, if this is as good a representation as I want it to be. Um, but think of this as a 3D wall of electric field coming uh, toward this window, right? And that wall of electric field is going to pierce um, the surface area, right? Now, obviously, the amount of electric field that pierces that surface area is going to depend on how the window is oriented. If the window is flush in the direction of the incoming fields, then the fields are going to hit the uh, surface, the window, and they're going to pass right through it. Right? When the window is flush in the direction of the electric field, the window is going to catch the maximum amount of the electric field. We say that this is a maximized flux. Okay, so when a surface area encloses 
Um, the maximum field vector values and what I mean by field vector values the electric I mean this is a field this is the electric field and this is a vector right and technically so is a by the way and we'll, we'll talk about the direction of a here in just a moment but you have a field that's in a that that is a vector quantity and so when the surface area encloses the maximum value of of the field vector values um, then we say that the flux is maximized okay under that condition the flux is maximized but what if I had the same electric fields and I oriented my window so that it was flat like this and the electric fields just went over it and nothing really went through it because it's flat under that case the electric field would be minimized or the electric flux, I'm sorry. Not lined, but when no field lines are enclosed. Flux is zero. And maybe perhaps enclosed is, is bad language because we're not surrounding them with a surface. We're letting them pierce a surface, right? We are letting them pierce a surface. But um, the definition here, okay, you can see when the window is flush, to the magnetic or to the electric field rather you're going to have a maximized flux and when the window is perpendicular to the field then you're going to have um, no flux okay now th the reason I say that the window is perpendicular and the reason um, we talk about the surface direction of an area remember areas are vectors too remember areas are vectors too and areas have a direction that is normal to their surface so in this case this window would have a um, normal vector if it's if it's flat um, to your line of sight then the normal vector would be in the direction of the electric field in this case and in this case, if the window is flat like this, then the normal vector is in this direction. And so you can see that the flux is maximized when the normal vector, n, this is the direction of the area, and the normal vector here, okay, in, in the first case, n is parallel with e and here n is perpendicular to e and so there's a vector function that describes this exact situation when two vectors are parallel their uh, value is maximized and when they are perpendicular their value is zero this is the dot product so the definition of electric flux is and we we, we um, define flux by the uh, symbol phi okay so the electric flux is defined as a dot e 
cosine of theta and theta is the angle between the normal vector of A and the unit vector of E. Okay? Um, it's often customary to write it like this, E dot A cosine theta. Okay? But this is the flux. This is the definition of electric flux. Okay. So, um, what now? How does this help us calculate electric fields? Well, imagine I have a random, it, it's really hard for me to draw 3D surfaces, but imagine that this is just a random 3D surface, okay? Imagine this is a random 3D surface. And imagine that, again, I have um, electric fields in space coming from some source. I don't care what they are. But these field lines um, are such that they can pierce this surface, right? They can pierce this surface. Here's where the element of the enclosed part comes in, right? So when I have electric field lines from an external source that is not enclosed by my surface, then for every field line that penetrates into that, the volume enclosed by that surface, it will exit. And so I have positive flux going in on this side and I have negative flux whoops this should be drawn from here and I have negative flux coming out this side and so my net flux through a surface Um, that does not enclose any charge will be zero. Okay, so Gauss's law does not allow me to say anything about the electric fields in space from objects other than what it is enclosing. So I have to enclose my source of charge to say anything meaningful about the electric field, okay? But if I do enclose that charge, so watch what happens, okay? Watch what happens. Suppose that I now place a source charge inside my, um, surface and actually you know what I, I don't want to use red since I used surf, uh, red for my surface let's use green so let's let green be my charge Q and if this is you know more or less a point charge then my field lines are gonna radiate out and then pierce the surface and I'm only gonna have a net outward flux as my field lines pierce my surface and then they are outward. So I'm only going to have a net outward flux. Um, and if I consider my red boundary as a an imaginary surface that in, that's enclosing that charge, I can now say something. But here's why we want those highly symmetric situations. If I have a randomly drawn object calculating the surface area of that surface is going to be extremely difficult. Okay. 
calculating the integral of the surface area of that is going to be extremely difficult. Okay, And if there's not an, a fundamental mathematical function that would define it, then I would have to use a computer. So this is why we want to use highly symmetric situations, because calculating DAs is hard, except in those symmetrical situations that I referenced. Okay, except in those symmetrical situations that I referenced. So, remember the flux is equal to E dot DA, or uh, 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 E dot A, actually. Um, and in fact, I think I need to adjust, yes. Um, I need to adjust this formula. The dot product automatically has the cosine in it, and I need to adjust this. Um, so the dot product is the uh, product of the magnitudes times cosine theta. So that is appropriate. I apologize for the, the mistake. Um, but now that we've got that corrected, remember that the flux is just going to be the um, field times the area, if I know what the area is. Okay. Um, if I don't know what the area is, if, if, if I have a weirdly shaped area, then the net flux is going to be the integral of the field piercing each area element. And I integrate this function over my surface. So this is what's known as a surface integral. And surface integrals are fundamentally different than just simple two-dimensional integrals where you can integrate over x and y because you may not be integrating over a surface. But surface integrals are explicitly a vector calculus feature or, or ve vector calculus uh, type of calculation. Okay, This is um, specifically taking a vector field and integrating it, multiplying it by a known functionality of a surface area and then integrating that over the entire surface to get the total flux. Okay, and if we want to use the symbol that we introduced in the last slide, should be consistent. So this is the flux. But again, you only have, this is only not zero when it encloses a charge. Okay, or charges. You only have a zero, a non-zero net flux rather. You only have a non-zero net flux when this quantity right here, the area that you've drawn encloses a charge. That's the only time it's not zero. So what that tells you is that the strength of the electric field as measured by calculating the flux should tell you something about the enclosed charge. So this is kind of like a, a conceptual motivation for Gauss's law. Okay, and um, for units to be uh, complete, we have to have the um, electric constant in there, or the the permeability or uh, permittivity of free space, rather. Okay, but that that's that's kind of a a philosophical motivation to think about this. So, how some simple applications, and we'll also outline the uh, uh, essential steps. Um, simple applications okay 
So I'm going to keep this equation here. And we'll apply it to the uh, probably simplest case that there is. And that's when we have a point charge. Okay, we have a point charge Q. And I'm going to enclose the charge with an imaginary sphere. Okay. And I'm going to center my charge at my sphere, but this is not essential. Okay. It doesn't matter where you put the charge inside that sphere as long as the um, charge is inside the sphere, but the calculation is easiest when you put the charge at the center of the sphere. So that's what we'll do. And so my sphere, I'm going to say that my sphere has a radius r. And I want to calculate the electric field at the value of the boundary. So what we're saying is at the, the value of this boundary, if my charge is at the center of this sphere, then everywhere on the boundary here, everywhere on the boundary of the sphere or everywhere on the surface of the sphere should have the exact same um, um, flux. Okay, so in other words, what we're saying is if I draw a piece DA across the um, surface of the sphere here toward the top and I draw another element toward the bottom, okay, and I look at the field lines emanating from this charge, if I assume it's a positive charge, then the strength and direction of these each of these field lines piercing each of those surface area elements, dA, should be the same. And so each piece of flux here, because this is a symmetric situation, each piece of flux here is going to be the same. So what we conclude here is that even if we don't know what the value of the electric field is, E is constant over the surface. Okay, E is constant over the surface. And so, what that allows us to do, okay, what that allows us to do, if you can assume that E is constant over the surface, and again, that only comes from the symmetry. Okay. The net flux wouldn't change if you moved the charge off of the center, but the uh, um, simplification of the constant electric field over the surface would be destroyed. Okay, um, so, so we try to keep these situations as symmetric as possible. And so, because E is constant, if you have something that's constant, it can come out of the integral. So E comes out of the integral and I'm left with dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. But dA, I'm just now integrating over the surface of the sphere. And we've already said what the surface area of a sphere is. It's 4 pi r squared. So when you're integrating, you integrate this over the imaginary sphere that you draw or the imaginary surface. And this is what we call a Gaussian surface. Okay, so you integrate over your Gaussian surface. Um, 
And so then we've got equals Q enclosed. Sometimes I wish I knew how to spell over epsilon naught. Um, we can solve for the electric field and this is Q enclosed over um, 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And if you want to get the direction of the electric field, then this would be in the r hat direction outward, right? Okay. But remember that Coulomb's constant is equal to 4 pi epsilon naught. So this is the same thing as saying Q times K over R squared times R hat. So this simple calculation has allowed us to recover the electric field as calculated from Coulomb's law. Okay? And if it didn't, if we got a different answer for our point charge, then we would be in trouble because that would mean either Coulomb's law was wrong or Gauss's law was wrong or both were wrong. And, and there was a third right answer that we needed to be looking for. But this gives us the electric field of the point charge. So that's a comforting uh, result, right? When, when you already know the, uh, the value something should have, and you find a new way to calculate that thing, it better agree with what you already know, if what you already know is true. Um, so that is probably the simplest example of uh, calculating something with Gauss's law. So what did, let's summarize our steps first things first. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll summarize our knowledge and our steps. So what is our knowledge? One. A net flux only occurs if a surface area and closes a charge. Two, the strength of that flux is proportional to the charge. Okay? The strength of that flux is proportional to the charge. Um, and steps. Okay, so this is going to be the general recipe for moving forward. One, once you have a charge distribution, draw an appropriate Gaussian surface. And I cannot specify this enough. I cannot emphasize this enough. Choose your um, shapes judiciously, okay? Choose your shapes judiciously. If you uh, aren't sure, um, then just ask yourself, does this problem look like a sheet? Does it look like a cylinder or does it look like a sphere, okay? And um, number two, Um, use symmetry to pull E out of the integral if possible. And number three, then calculate dA, um, the integral of dA, 
over the Gaussian sphere or surface and number four solve for E okay so when you're given some source of charge enclose it with an appropriate shape and um, then once you have enclosed it with an appropriate shape you can try to use symmetry to pull your electric field out of your integral and then just integrate over your surface and then solve for E. Okay, so these are the basic steps involved in Gauss's law. So in the next video we will look at um, a few more sophisticated examples and see how to um, um, show some interesting results.